their community grow as well um, and we're hoping to to meet some of the other chapters that are starting in Asia uh, but this is the manifesto um, that Creative Mornings headquarters sent out to everybody um, for telling everyone what we're really all about so I hope you've had a chance to read it I'm not going to read it we don't have too much time so <laughs> that was a picture of me tongue yes yes that was Henry tongue-tied so Creative Mornings was started in 2008 by Tina Roth Eisenberg um, in New York City. And you know, her goal was to have a platform for people to connect, um, to be inspired, and ultimately you know, make friends as well, um, and take, you know, take what they learn you know, hopefully with them on their journey, whatever that may be. Um, there's now over 130 chapters worldwide, um, and I believe there's now eight or nine in Asia. Uh, we're hoping to do a little mini Asia summit and meet some of the other hosts and co-organizers this year. Um, and the, the unique thing about Creative Mornings is there is a theme every month that the entire, um, you know, all the chapters will explore with their speakers um, in this month language, obviously. Um, and it, it, makes it, it makes it a challenge here. Um, and Henrik, by day, is a, a director of literacy for the Janus Blurton Family Development Center, um, specializing in working with um, dyslexic, dyslexic ch children. See, I can't even say it. <laughs> um, so, a wonderful, a wonderful day job. And at night, he's working with um, Peel Street Poets. Did I say that right? Yeah. Um, and emceeing the open mic nights. So that's been running quite a long time now, right? And ten, years. ten years. I've only been emceeing for three, but the whole thing's been going. Yeah, 10 years, so um, you can find him there um, and at Orange Peel in uh, Lang Kwai Fong. And they are running every Wednesday night except the first Wednesday of every month. Um, so it's something to certainly uh, go, go visit and check out, and I still need to as well, I would love to. So um, without further ado, um, please welcome Henrik to talk on Monday. try and go without mic. Uh, can you all hear me? It's pretty good, right? Uh, first off, before we start talking about anything, there are a bunch of empty seats here. I can't hear you very well. Uh, you can't? Oh, I got no mic. Uh, I hate mics. <laughs> okay, there are a bunch of empty seats here. Yeah, does anyone want to come sit uh, down quickly? Is that better? Hello? Oh. I killed the mic. Uh, there are a bunch of empty seats here. Uh, if you guys want to come down, there are like four, six, Eight, ten, empty seats scare me. It's like actually a phobia. I'll have a panic attack. No, no, no salad. I think the scad sign scared people off. Oh, there we go. The, the palpable relief. Um, so when I had to think about talking at Creative Mornings, it struck me as pretty funny because to me, that is a complete oxymoron. I am not creative in the mornings at all. And I googled around, and there is no such thing as creative last-minute panics, so I couldn't go talk anywhere else. <laughs> and the theme of language, while it seems to fit a lot, is a little odd because English isn't actually my native language, Danish. I didn't learn English until I was eight, but I teach dyslexic children in English, and I write poetry in English, so I guess I do have like half the resume to not make a complete fool of myself here. And we're going to see if I've succeeded. Down. Oh. Or up. Down. Oh, yeah. There we go. Okay, so the topic is language. Language, obviously, is a super narrow topic that I can cover in no time at all, and you will know literally everything about language. <laughs> I'm not just talking about English. The whole talk is going to be in Danish. Because there is, there is, oh, the biggest issue in Hong Kong, not enough people speak Danish. It's the one thing holding the city back will never be great. <laughs> Got it. One. Uh, there we go. Okay. So I had to kind of narrow down what I was going to talk about because language is obviously so broad. And 
has so many facets. And I decided that what I want to talk about is how falling into a gray zone and the way that you communicate between a couple of different extremes really often sells people short. I broke this down into three different categories. First is verbal communication, which is talks like this, speeches, that kind of thing. The second is in written communication. The last one is in how you present information. In each of these, I want to present you with two sort of opposite end extremes that you would do well to end up in one of the extremes, but when you end up in the gray zone, either you muddle your message uh, as you present it, or as your audience gets it, or basically something will go wrong. And before we get into these, I want to bring up an analogy, which I think I stole this from Wittgenstein. This is the analogy of a ladder that you discard. So all of this, becoming a great communicator, a great speaker, a great writer, requires these odd sort of uh, steps, bits of advice, that if you gave it to an expert communicator, they would tell you was wrong. But there are the steps that you need to take to climb this ladder that when you've reached the top, when you are a great communicator, a great speaker, a great writer, and I'm not necessarily claiming to be all of these, you discard the ladder. At that point, you can realize that some of the steps you took are not actually necessary. That gray zone is actually somewhere where you can be, where you can hang out, you can do good things because you know how to use it. But until you are that sort of expert level in these different areas, knowing where you fall in either of these camps that I'm going to present on each one is significantly better than not. And what I want to encourage you in the end is when you're preparing something like this talk or that email to your boss that actually legitimately matters, is to step back and in all these three things decide which end of the spectrum you should be on and then realign so that you are on that. And in between all of these, before we get to each category, I'm going to read you a little poem from my book. And for the third one, we're going to read a poem that all of you guys wrote, or two poems that some of you guys contributed to. And we'll see how that worked out, and you will all be judged very harshly. <laughs> all right, so the first one we're going to do is verbal language. And I'm going to, this is why I don't like the mic. Hard to hold a book and read a poem. Uh, this, uh, I will eventually have a book coming out, this very lovely leather-bound copy. It was a PDF of the book I was writing, stolen by my girlfriend and printed for Christmas. Aww. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> gently put the mic down. I'm not dropping the mic yet. <laughs> I'm also just not going to do that. Because as cool as it looks, it's rude. It's just rude. <laughs> this poem is called, as you can see, Death of a Peasant. And the stuff you'll be hearing if you come to open my poetry on Wednesday. Death of a pedant. I hadn't come. Another cautionary casual casualty of the caustic causality caused by reality, dead. But with undue fuss or must, he huffs and puffs, hoping that if he gets his panties in a tuft, death might say, fuck it, I've had enough, and throw him a bone better than dying alone. But he croaks. Like all the other folks, an amateur at life who never knew his way about, except the sullen fact that no man makes it out. So he turns to death, says, Did I do good? I mean, with what I had? And death says, Fucking hell, you were an English teacher. You mean, did I do well? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. If you expected serious, like, beautiful Shakespearean poetry, you're really in the wrong place. Okay, the dichotomy that I want to point out with uh, verbal language, mainly talks like this, comes down to, uh, if you finish this sentence, I'm at Creative Mornings attending a, the answer should be hopefully talk and not speech. What a speech is, is something that is in a written style and in a spoken medium. Reading and, sp and speaking to me are not just uh, mediums, like I'm literally speaking or I'm literally writing. They're also styles. Writing is sort of a more formal style, what you use in your e an email to your boss, when you're stating factual things. And speaking is also a style that is casual, that doesn't need as much grammar, that is much more flexible. and. You can have a spoken style in a written medium and a written 
style and the spoken medium. As well, let me show you. Um, no one here is the president of the United States, right? Okay, good. None of you need to make speeches. So there's one of these categories that we're going to cut out entirely. That is what I think sells people short on most talks. So this is a little empty table. Uh, along the top, we have written medium and spoken medium. So literally reading, or literally speaking, or literally writing. Now, something that would be a written medium, a written style, is like an essay, a newspaper article, formal writing, and literally writing. And what messes people up with talks is that the first thing they do when they know they're going to do a creative moments talk or something like this, is they go and they write down everything they're going to say. And you can't write down what you're going to say. You can't write in a spoken style. It's really hard to. If you're a very good script writer, you can do it because that's how we do movies. But generally, you're going to end up writing these sentences that are in a style that is factual and really, really boring to listen to. And when you get up here, there's going to be no conversational element. What you need to do is step back and look at what style you should be using, in this case, a talk is called a talk because it's a spoken medium and a spoken style. And what I find interesting about this is the, the hardest one to figure out is what is a written medium but a spoken style. A really excellent TED talk on this. Texting is the perfect example. Texting has all the hallmarks of speaking, but is obviously in a written medium, which is why we throw in stuff like lol that has like no meaning, you're not actually laughing. Wonderful little talk. Um, and uh, all I want to leave you with here is if you're doing something like a talk, or if you're writing an email, you need to step back and decide whether the style you're using is a written style or the style you're using is a spoken style. And <coughs> 10 minutes apart, you can send emails to two different people in both styles. But if you're not sure where you are, you end up either doing a talk where you're speaking way too formally and trying to read off a script and it sucks, or sending an email to your boss where you're honestly not formal enough and you never know why, but these jobs always peter out over time because you haven't established yourself in all those camps and you're maybe not ready to, to play in that gray zone. And in that case, it's probably better not to with emails to your boss, even if you weren't an expert. You just, you, you just never do it. <laughs> okay. The next part that we're going to deal with is uh, a dichotomy in written communication where falling in the gray zone can mess you up. And I'm going to read a little poem kind of related to creative language called Sentences. This was the, uh, the first poem I ever got published. I've been writing poetry for three years. If you've ever done anything like poetry short story writing, Submitting sucks. The rejection rate is ridiculous. I could take any rejection in the world. There was a period where I think I submitted a poem to a literary journal every day for like three months, and they don't get back to you for like nine months. So like nine or ten months later, it was just like every morning in my inbox, like, no, nah, we don't want it. No, nah, we don't want it. No, nah, we don't want it. It was really awful. And, we're like, and you get one that's like, yeah, maybe, can you edit it? Like, I really don't, just different theme, totally different theme. That'd be wonderful. So this is called Sentences. I, I just love language. I love messing around with language. Sentences. This sentence is self-referential. This sentence has five words. This sentence has five words or seven. This sentence will never have five words, nor a soulmate. This sentence, no verb. This jumbled sentence is, this sentence, fragment. This sentence ends in a non sequitur pacifist shuttlecock. This sentence ends quixotically. This sentence is not ironic. This sentence is short. The prisoner's sentence is extended. A tired sentence stops while a lively one runs on. Cette phrase est en français. This sentence ends the poem. Thank you. <laughs> My French is not as good as it used to be. Okay, so the dichotomy I want to deal with in written language is 
writing creatively versus writing plainly. Um, the main trap here, I think, is that uh, I think despite all the reinforcement of you should always use plain language, speak to your audience, uh, brevity is wit, and all that stuff, we still find ourselves a lot of the time wanting to sound fancy. And it's really not serving anyone. Uh, and when you end up in this gray zone, and I've done this way more than I should because I love creative writing, um, you, especially in Hong Kong, a language that's uh, a city that's like trilingual and has all expats coming from every part of the world, you throw in these colloquialisms just thoughtlessly and they end up confusing your audience mostly. Uh, and creative writing obviously has its place. I use it all the time. If any of you are in marketing, it's obviously very, very valuable. Um, but I think it's important to take a step back often and think if it'd be better off not only writing in plainer language that is more clear and more direct, but if even what you think is currently plain language is not as plain as you think. Um, anytime you're explaining or teaching, is when you want to be using plain language. Anytime you're trying to capture attention or do something striking, poetry, which can be striking despite everything you've seen today, <laughs> you want to use creative language. Uh, and I think uh, I kind of wanted to bring this point into advertising because I get the impression that a lot of people here may be in marketing. I think we really, really excellently use uh, images to capture attention, uh, and we don't do as well with language. And what we do with images is the more striking, the more weird, or the more almost out of place sometimes the image is, the longer the eyes will linger on it. And that's all. I, that's what a lot of advertising has become. The longer you can make someone's eyes linger on it, the better an ad it is. We're all fighting for time. And I think we can do that a lot better than we do with language. And this is going to be a little tangential, uh, the next slide. And you don't have to use this, but it's an interesting linguistic concept that I've never seen applied to advertising that I think would be cool. And it's called Zygma which has one key benefit, is that it's awesome to say. <laughs> so everyone on the count of three, you're gonna say Zygma. One, two, three. Zygma. Zygma. Yeah, you probably never heard of it. It's also called Solepsis. Uh, I went with Zygma because I don't know if I'm pronouncing Solepsis right. Zygma is a weird sort of uh, artifact of the English language where you have a part of the sentence that is, has its meaning changed by a later part of the sentence, but it's still totally grammatically correct. You risk getting into dangling modifiers, but I'm not going to go into that, that like English teaching stuff. But for example, this first sentence, I'll meet you in five minutes and the garden. The meaning of in is changed by the second half of the sentence. The first meaning is dealing with duration. I'll meet you after a duration of five minutes. And the second one is dealing with location. And something about that sentence and having to rejig the meaning and go back in your head just like stops you in your track. You literally will reread the sentence. Uh, hopefully that was the effect you had as well. It's not a sen sentence you can just read through and process correctly. Uh, and I think that's almost, that's similar in my mind to the effect of seeing a really, really striking image in an ad. And as sitting, I've had this idea festering in the back of my mind for a long time because I just, I, like the concept of Zygma is just cool to me. I was thinking, how could you use it in an ad? And uh, these two, if you work at PR th firms that are copyrighted, don't steal them. Uh, so if any of you work at Starbucks, I was thinking, I fell in Starbucks and love. And you just have, you know, an ad, a guy falling over and this beautiful girl there, or, you know, other way around, however you want to do it. Uh, and I assume a lot of you work in, in outdoor fishing supplies, so you can steal. When you're fishing for trout, and compliments. It changes the meaning of the word fishing. Um, I'm in no way encouraging you to run off and start using Zygma and everything. Uh, that is probably the opposite. If anything, it should be a re reassessment of how you use plain language more and how you use it better. But you know, if you want to, that's fine. Zygma and an email to your boss. 
Zygma in your newsletter to all your clients so they're all super confused. <laughs> Terrible ideas. <laughs> um, the last one I want to do is uh, a dichotomy between two ways to present things. But this is where I'm also going to try and read two poems written by you guys, if we have those collated. And if for those of you uh, that aren't sure what's going on, uh, 28 people were given strips of paper that had the numbers 1 to 14 with either a yellow or a green marker. Uh, and they are, have been collated into two sonnets, and we're going to vote on which team did the better sonnet. Ooh, maybe they have not been collated. Uh, I was going to try and have an audience member read each one. Does anyone want to volunteer? Read a sonnet. Yeah. Let's see if uh, this may be hard. Okay, how are we going to do this? We can make this work. What's your name? Vicky. Vicky. Give it up for Vicky. If anyone uh, has never encountered a sonnet before, they go, it's 14 lines, four stanzas, and every second line will rhyme, except for the last two, which will rhyme. These are the ones that Shakespeare wrote 150 odd of, but y'all are gonna kick his butt today. We're also missing, does anyone have yellow seven? You can collect your prize. Uh oh. And a, sorry, yellow eight? Anyone? What does eight have to rhyme with? Uh, one, two. What else are you missing? Oh, that's yellow three? Yeah. Four. <coughs> Five. Thirteen. Thirteen, fourteen. Okay, we're gonna. Yellow team, I'm very sorry, but you're missing out one stanza. Hands up if you're the yellow team. Who's team yellow? All right, these guys are gonna have written the first stanza that is missing one. That's green. Okay, the first one is gonna be missing lines five, seven, eight. So it's going to be a three stanza. Yeah, they go four, yellow, so four. Okay, Vicky, you ready? The man fought gently against the light. Give me some time, I'll commit a crime. And today, we are having a good bite. My daughter speaks English, and baby sign. Nothing was going to burn down Hong Kong. Because I'm so badass, like Captain Spock. <laughs> Communication is the key, Hong Kong. Rocks and boulders has caught me for shoulders, you cock. <laughs> I'm going for a leak, don't you peek. All creative mornings start with a peak. Nice. <laughs> All right, pretty good yellow team. Pretty good. Let's see if we can get green working. One, two, one, three. That's not how numbers go. Five, six, eight, ten, thirteen, twelve? Twelve, thirteen. Green team, you disappoint. There are like seven of these. Any green last minute? Okay, I'm gonna read green's very awkward. Let's see if we can. <laughs> Those two should rhyme. May, may, oh, yeah, okay. That's not long talk. That's, those will be the last two. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Not really a freak. Okay, green team. A very, uh, a very excellent creative attempt at a sonnet. No idea exists without a fight. Dance to the rhythm and the funky beat. I am here today thanks to my friend May. Be very happy today, you might. If time allows us, let us do what we may. I know you from Tinder, I'm not a freak. <laughs> Coffee, bagels, and one fantastic talk, I'm experiencing a mental block. <laughs> okay. 
Hands up if you think the yellow team won. Hands up if you think the green team won. <laughs> Damn. Green team. 14 lines. Just gonna, just gonna, outside the box. I thought Shakespeare would be sad. Okay, the last dichotomy I want to present is something I called sandwich versus surprise, which is already self-explanatory, so I'm not gonna explain it. No, uh, sandwich versus surprise, and how you present things. I think there are, there are a lot of ways to present things, uh, but there are two really broad categories that I think work very well, and one of them is what I call sandwich, which is very similar to the type of essay structure that you were probably taught in high school, which goes, this is what I'm gonna talk about. This is me talking about it. This is what I talked about. Where you sort of, you tell people what you're gonna do, then you do it, then you tell them what you did. And that is actually really awesome. It is, the reason you're taught it is because it's really, really damn effective. Uh, and ending up in the gray zone is mostly a product of just kind of feeling, I think a lot of people feel like that's a little blase to be that obvious, but it works for a reason. I think it's very good to take a step back and go back to that. Go back to sort of the very straightforward presentation of information. I think it serves you very well, especially if you are teaching. Anytime you're teaching any concept, like what I'm doing here, this is what you should be doing. That's why I told you up front what I'm gonna be doing. Now I'm doing it, and then interspersing poetry for no reason, which you should also be doing at every opportunity. But people tend to stray into sort of gray zone away from that, and I don't think that serves anyone well. The alternative, the alternative, which is more for creative endeavors, is what I call surprise, which is where you set up expectations and then you subvert them. This is what most of comedy relies on, this is what almost all my poetry relies on, and this is what communication and good advertising very often benefits from. Um, but if you're not sure which you are doing, you're either setting people up with expectations that you're not fulfilling, or if you're not sort of setting up the expectation before you subvert it or deliver your punchline effectively, then you're also going to model your message. Um, so what this is gonna form, essentially, is a big takeaway that will be three dichotomous ideas. Oh, I forgot about that slide, last minute edition. Uh, I want to do a little exercise with the idea of subverting language uh, to show what I mean by, by expectations and uh, subversion and how it can make for really good creative writing. And this is gonna be audience interactive as well. Note, I stole this from a very good high school teacher of mine who taught religious education and philosophy and was just crazy. Um, but one day, he came up and he wrote this on the board. Bobby opened a garbage can and looked, and he left it blank. And he spent the whole lesson on this. He said, what is the best word you can come up with here? Uh, first, can someone give me the very obvious word? What is the normal word that you go here? Inside. inside. It's definitely inside. What is a better word? A more interesting word? You know? Sad. Sad. Great. Awesome. Open the garbage can. Ooh, looks sad. You know, maybe that sandwich wasn't as good looking as it was the day before. Anyone else? Better word than sad? Or better Suspicious. Puzzle? Suspicious. Puzzle. Love it. Awesome. Good? These are all great. Here's the best answer, the most subversive answer. Bobby opened the garbage can and looked out. <laughs> it's genius. It's, I didn't come up with this, but it is literally genius. It is the perfect subversion of expectations. Your expectation, if someone opens a garbage can, is that they are outside the garbage can. So, that's what I mean. And that's the, like, the root of comedy or into psychological research, which not many, not many people are, but the root of comedy is subversion of expectation. That's why that is funny. Okay, now for the actual takeaway. We have two quick slides of takeaways. The first one is three dichotomies, and all I would want you to do with these, if you were gonna use them in your life, is if you have a talk or a big piece of writing or a social situation or something coming up, 
and it's just not quite clicking, take a step back and ask yourself whether the style you should be using is formal writing or social speaking in style. The medium will do itself. Like the medium here is a talk. I can't do anything about that. The medium in a newspaper article is writing. I can't do anything about that. But there are times when the style in a newspaper article for a specific audience maybe should be speaking or should be writing. And if you're not yet a really, really confident writer, trying to play around in that gray zone will hurt your message. The second one, for a second, I thought I misspelled the word. That would have really bugged me. I am actually pedantic. Um, second one is creativity versus plain language. Whether or not you should be trying to get creative with language at all, and whether or not what you're thinking of as plain and easy to understand is actually simple enough for your audience, especially given language barriers and differences in sort of colloquial language. Uh, I once went back to my family in Denmark, well, I go back every year, but I once went back for Christmas and uh, I, I retranslate colloquialisms accidentally. So in English you would say, uh, I'm full after you've eaten too much. So I get up from the table and I'm like, I'm full. Not realizing that in Danish, I'm full means I'm drunk. <laughs> so I literally like push my plate away, I was just like, I'm drunk. <laughs> See you guys. They're like, what? So you might not even realize some of the time. Uh, and the last one is whether or not you should be sandwiching your information expectation a lot and subvert it very obviously, or really sandwich your information very intensely. Tell them up front what you're going to do, then do it, and then tell them what you did. And the last two takeaways, I've not talked about it at all, but I wanted to drop in. One is the 10, 20, 30 rule. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. Um, I didn't make this up, but you go to a lot of PowerPoints in Hong Kong, and PowerPoints with a lot of text really annoy me. So I just want to pass on the 10, 20, 30 rule, which is if you're ever making a PowerPoint, and some of you will all do this in your life, maximum 10 slides, maximum 20 words on each slide, and everything has to be 30 point font or bigger. <laughs> Trust me, if you force yourself to stick to those, you get slightly better PowerPoints. They'll never be as amazing as this one. But, you know. <laughs> um, and the last one is poetry is awesome. All of you should come to poetry. Uh, I feel like I meet a lot of people who just don't realize that there is a crazy kick and creative poetry community in Hong Kong because you think it's this like filthy wasteland of uncreative bankers who just rob people in the street. And you're not wrong, <laughs> but there is poetry too. Uh, and it's every Wednesday at Orange Peel at 8 p.m. I am see the thing. I'm super nice. We love first-time readers. People will probably buy you beer if you read for the first time. It's just awesome. Uh, and you can find us online at facebook.com slash peelstreetpoetry or peelstreetpoetry.com. And that is my talk. Thank you guys so much for listening. Thank you so much, Henry. That was brilliant. Um, do we have any other creative writers in the audience? Anyone into creative writing? I was gonna try. Ah, I got it. But you know, I think I think it's time that I put some effort into it, and that really helped me realize that. So yeah, excellent. It would be wonderful. Uh, you should you should see the stuff I wrote when I first showed up at poetry. Oh man, <laughs> don't like, don't worry. It's always a learning process and everyone is super nice, so don't, yeah. We get that a lot. Encouraging, encouraging people who show up and have written stuff to actually get up and read is probably the hardest part of my MCing. Because, you know, I mean, everyone's scared to put themselves out there. God, it gets so much better. And you develop all these, like, accidental skills and self-confidence. You're like, I wasn't supposed to have this. But I read poetry so much and made a fool of myself so many times that one day I just, like, they just happen. Do it. Thank you. I will. <laughs> um, we have a few minutes for Q and A, so let's carry on with that. Um, would we? Do we have? Oh, we have the other microphone. There we go. If you could just say your name, and even if you want to, what you do, um, and then um, do we have a few questions for him? Thank you. Hi. Um Peter, um, one of those nasty bankers, and 
I'm sorry. How do you, how do you um, teach the dyslexic kids? How do I teach them? Yeah, like what are the new skills or how do you get them? Uh, okay, so um, the current psychological understanding of dyslexia is that it is a difficulty with phonemic processing, which is uh, attaching sounds onto symbols. So you have the letter A, which is just a symbol that makes the sound A, or the long sound A. And dyslexic kids have difficulties with uh, establishing these relationships neurologically and uh, the rules that govern how we manipulate sounds and symbols. So you teach dyslexic children through a uh, phonemic uh, system, so you teach them phonics, and you teach them very rule-heavy phonics, and you try and integrate uh, multiple senses because there is uh, visual disruption. So, for example, if I'm teaching a kid to spell, not only will it be using sound, but I'll have them spelling it out with their fingers, so they like, at before I let them spell, stuff like that. I, I teach a program called Orton Gilliam, which is probably the oldest uh, dyslexic targeted uh, literacy program, uh, and I teach one on one. Anyone else? Questions? I love to answer questions. One at the back. Um, there's, a, there's a mic coming. You can keep it, take it home, it's a present. <laughs> yes, that's totally why I came here. Um, hi, my name is Ree. Um, you're not allowed to say yourself, but do you have a favorite poet? And if you do, why? Uh, okay, so I'm gonna go to, this is weird, because I don't write that serious po poetry stuff, but I really, really like it. Uh, Thomas Hardy is probably my favorite poet. Uh, there's a poem called The Dark Link Thrush that I really, really like. Uh, I like Wilfred Owen a lot as well, Doug Head to Call Mass. Um, but I'm so involved with the local community. They're, I like, most of my favorite poem, poets are my friends. Uh, if any of you have ever gone to events around here, uh, there's a woman called Keisha, who's a ridiculous poet. Uh, there's a man called Vishal Nanda, who's a good friend of mine, who's a ridiculous poet. Uh, so probably my two favorite poets are them two, and they're local Hong Kong poets. Well, local and local. As local as you can be for an Indian man and a black woman. <laughs> Uh, hot. Uh, no, it doesn't work. Push it up. Push it up. It is. It's all online. Uh, hi. Hey. Hey. Uh, I'm Amy. I'm a digital strategist at an ad agency. Um, I was wondering if for I'll throw you a softball. Um, for your poetry night, uh, is participating, um, doing a reading, an expectation, or are people welcome to just come and listen as well? You can absolutely just come and listen. Uh, so the way I run it, uh, and we're probably going to keep it like this for a while, but we're getting bigger, so I may have to look into other things, is we do two rounds, and the first one, I basically pick someone who I know is going to read, and we kind of just go around the room clockwise, and everyone can just say, oh, I'm not reading, I'm a civilian, or like, I'll read. And that it seems to really encourage new people to come up. Uh, and then uh, we'll take a break, uh, make use of happy hour before it ends, and then the second round, uh, I usually read a poem and I will just sit down and leave the mic open and people will just come up. There's absolutely no expectation that you have to read it off, but you will have me on stage probably at some point and be like, you reading, 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 no, no, and you just go. Although, don't, don't do this, a lot of people do this. You're not actually like invisible. Not, if that worked, like, we would do a lot of things differently. Hi, my name's Kat. Oh, that's my voice. Um, what was the last book you read that made an impact on you, whether it's like a poetry anthology or anything, really? Oh, man. I read a lot. Uh, I just finished book four of Malazan, Book of the Fallen, but it uh, didn't make an impact on it. It's a good, really good book, but it's just, you know, fantasy. Um, the last book that I really, really loved was um, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. It is a medical nonfiction book about a black woman called Henrietta Lacks in the 40s who developed... Yes, her DNA, uh, yes. well, her cells were used yes, to heal cells. do things. Uh, so she, things. She, developed, um, she develops a type of cancer, she dies, uh, they get her, her cells, and for whatever reason, when they put them in an agar jar, unlike other cells, they just will not stop reproducing. They keep reproducing, and they just won't stop. 
And the benefit, uh, the good thing about this is you have an infinite supply of cells. And they start sending them all over the country and they get used in all kinds of research. They're still like by far the most medical used research things today. They were used for the polio vaccine. But this woman dies totally anonymously. Her family never receives a dollar. No one knows who they are. And the book is this journalist trying to trace her family down. Oh, it's so good. Uh, and I started reading that because I'd read The Emperor of All Maladies, which is the Pulitzer Prize winning book on the history of cancer. Also really, really good. Um, I just started reading Breakfast of Champions by Kurt Vonnegut. Oh man, I miss Kurt Vonnegut. Like I just, I haven't read a Kurt Vonnegut book in like 10 years. I start reading the first few pages, I'm like, oh, I missed you. <laughs> it's like one of those, you can just read, you know, I know I'm reading Kurt Vonnegut because I'm laughing at every page. And there is a drawing of a vagina, which you don't get in books. <laughs> if you've ever read, but he's just like, I lived in America. This is what the flag looks like. People were really scared of a couple of things like, da, 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 and you draw it. And people were really scared of vaginas. This is what a vagina looks like. And it's feel like he's just drawn it in pencil. It's so funny. Um, so yeah, uh, you asked for a book that, book that impacted me and I gave you four. Thank you. Uh, these, this will all be on the test. <laughs> uh, that was a lot of, yeah. Thank you guys so much. Uh, my dad used to write poetry, so this has inspired me to go pull up a few of his and maybe I'll pop by your open mic night. <laughs> um, so we have a few things going on. Uh, given it is the new year, we want to, you know, with our, uh, the co-organizers we met a few weeks ago, um, and we really want to try and do a bit more with the community um, besides just the normal morning events as well. Um, so you, if you follow us on uh, Facebook and so on, and there, I think you guys have started receiving newsletters too. Um, if you're signed up to the community. That will tell you what's going on around the globe a little bit more. Oh, hold on one second. So for example, on one of the newsletters, there's an illustrator. I have to press it again. <laughs> a little tribute to David Bowie, um, which we'll show you in a second. Um, but our, our next event is going to be on the 19th of February, um, and the, the topic is ethics. So it should be, again, an interesting one. Um, and we're uh, at that event, we'll probably announce a few of the other social things we want to try and put together for you guys. So not just um, the Friday morning, but maybe some social outings, um, drinks, um, or maybe do something for charity um, and get out and also just be able to engage with each other a bit more often. So um, we'll keep you posted on that. Am I forgetting anything, George? I usually forget something, so. <laughs> ah, yes. Yes, yeah, see? I, I mentioned it too. <laughs> uh, apart from Open Mic Poetry Nights, I'll probably be launching my first collection in April. Uh, we'll probably throw a big dash at Orange Peel, which is what we usually do for uh, book launches, and should be fun. <laughs> Come along, by my book. Oh, it's called Irreverent Poems for Pretentious People. Uh, is anyone here pretentious? The book is targeting no one? Uh, just me. Excellent. Yeah, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, looking forward to it. Yeah, I'll put the music Yeah. I'll tell Tina, you need to add this in. Um, the global newsletter. The global newsletter. Uh, did we have a slide of the newsletter on here? Okay, so if you did see the newsletter um, come out, I think one, they send it in New York time, so you get it like 10 p.m. at night, so um, keep an eye out for them, but they're actually picking people from the community all over the globe, um, so you might actually, I would encourage you to put your photo up, fill out, answer some of the questions, um, and you might see your face going around to the entire community globally. Um, so yeah, watch out, have a, have a good picture. Um, and another obsession for Creative Mornings is GIFs. So this is one, and you'll see some of those on, um, and that's why one of the questions on the, the website is what's your favorite. Um, but we just thought we'd do a little tribute to David Bowie to finish today. This is by an illustrator. Um, Helen, and I forget her surname. Marie Green. See, yay, look at all of you. Helen Green. Do we have the music? Oh, I don't know how to do that. But thank you all for coming. Have a fantastic Friday and happy Chinese New Year as well. I hope you have some fun plans. Thank you for